a beloved high school cheerleader. She was friends with so many different people. She was beautiful, she was smart, she was social, and just a good person. Whose life is suddenly cut short. When I saw Demi covered in blood, I remember as if it was yesterday. This is a cautionary tale. I had no idea that she was in any sort of danger whatsoever. Not. This young man would not take no for an answer. A teenage romance gone horribly wrong. She had moved on. He had not. What? He didn't break the door? Wow. The defense tried to make the medicine out to essentially be the big bad wolf. How do we protect our kids from abuse we don't see? I saw nothing because I didn't know what I was looking for. But there were signs everywhere. I'm Tony Harris. In my 30 years as an investigative reporter, I've learned that every crime reveals a world of trouble, a family, a neighborhood, an entire town, changed forever. Come with me to the scene of the crime. school, an American institution where our sons and daughters go to learn, forge friendships, and cheer on the home team. For many, it's a place where one comes of age, where hormones run high and young love blooms. Just east of Pittsburgh, in the suburb of Monroeville, Gateway High School is at the center of teenage life. Home to the Gators, this community lives for the Friday Night Lights. But in 2007, the murder of a beloved Gateway cheerleader, 16-year-old Demi Kusha, would shatter this community. The 911 call, they found a 16-year-old girl lying in the street with stab wounds to the chest and neck. The girl, Demi Kusha, died a short time later. I'm here to explore a side of teen life that even vigilant parents can miss. And to find out how young love escalated to violence that no one saw coming. Demi's mother, Jody Maselli, lives in the townhouse she'd once shared with her daughter. You still have so many of her things. Yeah. These are things that I just looked at and I th thought this belongs, this belongs. Right. This here um, is a picture of Demi. She was about 11 years old. You can see her dimples yeah. and how happy she is. This child just had so much sunshine to give to other people. You know, she had a happy spirit, and she would always look at the positive, whatever the situation was. Demi was very kind. She was very compassionate. She loved and adored her sister, Sage, and uh, her brother, Jake. Everything that her older brother could do, she could do, too. If Jake was out there riding his bike, well, you know, she was going to rip her training wheels off and she was going to ride her bike. Demi was just always smiling, always bubbly, always happy. Her energy could take the, the room in whatever direction she wanted to take it. You know, she just always had this strong, strong personality. What's your name? Demi. Demi what? When Demi was four years old, her parents divorced and her father remarried. But life's changes didn't stop her from pursuing her own goals. High school, 
It's a place many teenagers begin to establish themselves. About to turn 16 years old, Demi is looking forward to her junior year and cheering on the varsity squad. This is her freshman year cheerleading. How important a moment was this? Just proud, you could see. She was committed to whatever she tried to accomplish, and she did accomplish this all right. on her own. On her own, yeah. Mm -hmm. Demi's enthusiasm was infectious, something her friends remember well. Demi loved going to the game. She loved all of that. How close were you? We were very close. Well, she always made every minute so much fun. Popular? Yes. She's friends with so many different people and then became friends with their friends. And Yeah, no one ever had anything bad to say about her. Everybody knew her name. Everybody loved her. In 10th grade, 15-year-old Demi drew the attention of her brother's best friend, a high school senior named John Malarkey. He would become her first boyfriend, and they would date on and off for a year. You saw this developing, didn't you? I did. He'd come over and hang out with Jake, and in passing by, he'd, you know, hey, hi, Demi. When she noticed that John kind of had an eye for her. She probably thought, okay, I'm in high school and I'm a cheerleader and now I got this boy that likes me and this is all good. What did you know about him? I knew that he wrestled and he liked to ride quads at Jake's father's house. And he just seemed like, a, you know, an okay guy. It seemed like everything was fine. We all would just always hang out. He'd make jokes with us. When they were together, they always seemed happy. I was never too happy with her dating. I thought that she was too young at the time. I just thought, and on Demi's end, it was a little crush. Just typical teenage stuff. Were you strict as a parent? Yes. Dating was held at a minimum because she was young. She did not have free reign over her time. I always had my eyes open. It's natural for parents to be cautious, but nothing about their daughter's first romance indicated to Demi's parents she might be in grave danger. August the 15th was a pretty normal day. I remember distinctly she had left over a birthday cake, so it was the day after her 16th birthday. I was getting ready to take my son, Jake, to community college down the road for orientation. Demi was home. She had a sore throat and needed to take a nap. And she kind of sleepily woke up and grabbed her phone. She's like, oh, my God, all I want to do is rest, and all John does is keep texting me. So I said to her, you know, just rest, and gave her a kiss goodbye, and off we went. It was exactly 6 o'clock at night. Demi had called me on my cell phone. She was working on some poster boards for cheerleading, but she wasn't feeling good. And I said, I'll call when I get home, and that was it. At 6.15 p.m. that evening, Officer Sarah Bonner is on patrol. What do you recall about August 15th, 2007? It was very routine. I remember the, the, the sun was out. It was a, a typical August day. I was um, approaching the main intersection of Route 48 and 22, which is the intersection that we're approaching now. When the call came out, it was a, um, a hot call, and that lets us know that they need people to respond. Yeah. There had been a stabbing. There really was limited detail. We just knew that we, we needed to get there and, and, and assess the situation. 
I just hid all my lights, turned my siren on, and headed to the pool. There's not a lot of room here. When I arrived initially, I saw the neighbor stand in there, waving to me. I exited my patrol vehicle. I used the wall as cover with my weapon out. I approached the neighbor, at which time I saw Demi sitting below the neighbor, covered in blood. What happens next? I immediately holstered my weapon. I didn't look for anybody else. I focused on Demi. I told her she was going to be OK. She didn't look anywhere else. She just kept looking at me. She's a young girl, and she's bleeding out. Were you more than an officer in that moment when you were trying to comfort her? If I was a police officer at the time I was with Demi, my weapon would have been out. But I wasn't. I was a mother. And she was someone's daughter. I didn't realize there was a danger so many feet down the driveway. Who would want to hurt Demi? Is this a case of random violence? Or is the danger down the driveway someone she knows? Demi Kusha is a popular student at Gateway High School in Monroeville, Pennsylvania. It's the day after her 16th birthday, and Demi is home alone making cheerleading posters. That day, we had cheerleading practice, and she came in jumping for joy. She got her permit. She was so excited. And later, we had made plans to go do something since I didn't get to see her on her birthday. That afternoon, Amber receives word from Demi canceling plans. She said that she was going to do something with John instead. She put her away message on, so that's the last time I talked to her. I was on the phone with her that night, but she didn't share with me that he was on his way over to the house. It was a surprise to everyone that John was coming over. Just two weeks before her birthday, Demi had ended their relationship. At the scene, Officer Bonner stays by Demi's side while waiting for police backup. As my lieutenant arrived, and Demi was screaming, he did this, he did this, at which time a neighbor said, he's over there. He being John Malarkey. I approached him from his feet closest to the fence. My lieutenant approached him from the front. Both of our weapons were drawn. My lieutenant said, where's the weapon? Which time he pulled his hands out and he motioned, pointed towards the townhouse. When he lifted his head, blood was gushing out. He had a slice from ear to ear. It turns out John had slit his own throat after stabbing Demi multiple times. Demi is quickly losing a lot of blood. And when the first medic arrives to the scene, he rushes first towards the attacker, not the victim. I remember saying to one of the medics, I need you here first. They were redirected to him. I remember as if it was yesterday. I said, no, I have the victim here. I know that with the, her injuries, there was nothing that could have been done. 
from the time the medics took her to the hospital, but it's just... You wanted assistance here with now, Demi. right. Demi's mother, Jody, and her brother, Jake, are at a college orientation when Jody's phone starts buzzing. Thinking to myself, who is trying to get a hold of me? My gut told me, you know, pick it up, see what's going on. So I hit my voicemail, and I could hear, like, all this chaos. And I couldn't make out what it was, so I hit delete, next, more chaos, delete, hit next. Heard another voice say, Jody, you need to get up to Forbes Hospital. John stabbed Demi. And I just remember shutting my phone, and then I said, I gotta go. Demi is rushed to the hospital in an ambulance. Doctors try to save her, but she's lost too much blood and dies shortly after arrival. <sighs> Jody is the first to receive the news that her daughter is gone. It's just something that is so profound and it changes everything. It changes everything. When I think about it. <laughs> According to the coroner's report, Demi was stabbed 16 times with a three and a half inch hunting knife. I can just remember seeing my beautiful daughter laying on the gurney, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, somebody do something, like somebody help her. She's just laying here. How could something like this happen? And this boy went through school under the radar, never really was in trouble, played sports, was a friend of my son's. I wanted to know where he was. After he was stabilized by local doctors, John is airlifted to a hospital in Pittsburgh for further treatment. While back at the crime scene, county police discover a knife covered in blood. They also find two cell phones. There was a, a pretty chilling message on one of those cell phones. One text in particular that Correct. was pretty chilling, wasn't it? Yes, it was from um, John to his parents and it stated that he was at Demi's, he had stabbed himself and that he loved his parents. That made it clear to you at least that he came here in an attempt to carry out a murder-suicide. Yes. Despite his attempt to kill himself, John survives. Police charge him with the murder of his ex-girlfriend. In shock, the community holds vigil for Demi. Her friends are planning a candlelight vigil for Demi Kusha Sunday night at 8 o'clock at the Gateway High School football stadium. I don't live in Monrobo anymore, and uh, every time I come to Monrobo, I think about the, the ambulance going to, to Demi's house and, and just think of all of that stuff. There's some good memories here for you connected to Demi's time here. And there's the, the bitter and that, that John was here. And, and, you know, both of these kids walked these halls. Two months before Demi lost her life, my son and John graduated. And we sat up in those bleachers. 
and Demi sat with me and my wife Sue and my daughter Alexa because we watched that together and I filmed my son graduating. I also filmed him graduating. It was the first boy she ever really liked. It was her older brother's friend who was always around the house. I had no idea that she was in any sort of danger whatsoever. That was just two months prior to her losing her life. High school love, it's often fickle. Teenagers get together and break up. But what happened here? Why would a young man, a high school graduate with his whole life in front of him, commit such a brutal crime? In a hospital room in Pittsburgh, John Malarkey would offer up his defense in just a few written words. On August 15, 2007, 16-year-old Demi Kusha is stabbed to death in her home. And her ex-boyfriend, John Malarkey, is the only suspect in her murder. He tried to take his own life that night, but survives. For the next three weeks at a hospital in Pittsburgh, he begins to recover, not as a free man, but as a prisoner, chained to his bed. John is watched around the clock, but during a routine shift, one detective on guard duty would gain important insight into the mind of a young man who felt jilted by his ex. It was the afternoon shift at 4 p.m. I positioned myself in the room so I could clearly observe him at all times. He was not able to talk because of what he had done to himself. So the hospital had provided him with a dry erase board to communicate with the doctors and nurses. About two hours into the shift, I remember him tapping on that dry erase board to get my attention. And he started writing on the board. John writes, what is a preliminary hearing? And shows it to Detective Kuma. The detective explains that a preliminary hearing helps determine if there is enough evidence to go to trial. John nods, and the conversation ends. But three hours later, he taps on the board again. This time he wanted to tell me more about his version of what happened. I walk over to his bedside, and he writes on the board, if I did something wrong, but he quickly scratches that off with his hand and rewrites, if someone did something wrong and they were on medication that made them do it, could they still be found guilty? He goes on to say that he was on this medication for acne called Accutane. He wasn't saying, I didn't do this. Correct. It appeared to me he was trying to use Accutane as a defense for his actions, that this medication that made him violent and not the person who he thought he should be. Really? Yes. Accutane is a brand name for isotretinoin. It's known to clear up the most severe cases of acne. John had been taking a generic brand of the drug, though many in this case would refer to it as Accutane. At the time of Demi's murder, reported side effects from Accutane had been making headlines nationwide. Many parents and teenagers have found Accutane extraordinarily effective. But it may also be the cause of such serious side effects that some parents blame it for the suicide of their children. The company is updating its warnings to doctors and patients, saying Accutane, quote, may cause depression, psychotic symptoms, and rarely, suicide attempts and suicide. On the FDA's website, I discover a list of distressing side effects to the active ingredient in Accutane, including violent behavior. 
And it says here that the drug can cause serious mental health problems, including depression, suicide, and psychosis. Now, that's according to the manufacturer. John had been taking the drug for a few months while he was dating Demi. And sure, it's a controversial drug, always has been. But the question is, could it possibly lead a young man to commit murder? I'm on my way to meet Judge Mark Tranquilli. In 2009, he was the lead prosecutor in the case against John Malarkey. This was not a whodunit. There was no question of what happened here. It was just a question of degree. John Malarkey claimed that because he had been taking Accutane, that that somehow caused some break with reality that made it impossible for him to form the specific intent to kill. And what the defense tried to do was take a first-degree murder down to a voluntary manslaughter, which would give him a shot at daylight at some point down the line. The defense had to convince the jury that John Malarkey was not aware of what he was doing that day because of the Accutane. Some of the side effects that are reported are, are kind of scary. Did you think it was potentially tricky for you? Between myself and my lead detective, we had never heard of Accutane, let alone known anything about it. So was I concerned about it at first? Hell yes, I was very concerned. I said, what, you know, what's going on here? especially in light of the fact that John didn't really have any criminal background. I thought, you know, this could be a defense that would be very attractive to people who were looking to cut a young guy a break and give him a second chance. The trial of John Malarkey opens in Pittsburgh in June 2009. It's the first time the drug in Accutane has been used as a defense in a homicide case. At trial, the defense argued that John had gone over to Demi's to win her back. That in the days and weeks leading up to that day, he was distraught. In part because he had abruptly stopped taking his medication, possibly triggering severe psychosis. To combat the defense's argument, the prosecution calls to the stand Dr. Mark Sorali, a board-certified dermatologist. In your assessment, what was the problem, the central problem, with the testimony, the expert testimony being offered by the defense for John? Simple. There was no scientific backing. No scientific backing. Yeah. In April 2007, John began taking isotretinoin to treat his acne. Initially, he complained of headaches, and his doctor reduced his use from two pills a day to just one. By the time of the murder, John's acne had improved, and he had stopped taking the medication. You took a look at his dermatology history. What did you see here? John was watched very closely by his dermatologist at the time, and they monitored his blood work, saw him regularly. And importantly, no unusual behaviors reported or exhibited. The defense was claiming that this altered behavior was brought on by side effects from Accutane. Is there a, a risk, a danger to stopping the drug? No, not at all, because patients don't go through withdrawal on the medication. This medicine does not make people become violent, aggressive, and does not lead to the behaviors that lead to homicide. So why the scary warning from the FDA? Dr. Sorali clarifies that the government is obligated to report any and all possible side effects, whether they've been proven or not. Though Accutane was eventually taken off the market in 2009, Generic brands of isotretinoin are still prescribed to teenagers today. But they tried to make the medicine out to essentially be the big bad wolf. No longer concerned about John's Accutane defense, 
The prosecution focuses on the evidence and witness testimony, revealing a pattern of abuse they believe escalated to murder. John Malarkey knew what he was going to do to Demi if he didn't get the answer he was looking for. As prosecutors argue their case against John Malarkey in the murder of his ex-girlfriend, 16-year-old Demi Kusha, they reveal an evidence trail, a host of warning signs that everyone, including those closest to the couple, somehow missed. You see two kinds of people when you're a homicide prosecutor. The hopeless cases that had two strikes against them the day they were born, and it's no surprise they ended up the way they did. The other type you see is people who do something that just seems to be completely uncharacteristic, and that one fatal mistake dictates the rest of their lives. Was that John? Yeah, that was John. There wasn't the pervasive drug use. There wasn't the, you know, problematic brushes with the law. None of that. And Demi's life seemed on track. Demi was beautiful. She was smart. She was social. And just a good person. But what I learned very quickly was that there was a whole dark side to Demi's life that her parents were pretty much unaware of. And that's really one of the big tragedies of this case. As parents involved in our children's lives, we want to believe we are fully connected, that we know everything there is to know to keep them safe. But there are often things we don't see that seem to come out of nowhere. For the family and friends of Demi Kusha, the hazard in her life would only be revealed after her death. At school, everything always looked great. But Demi would tell us, and he just, like, blows up my phone. Just constant text messages. Who are you with? When are you going to be done? I need you to come do this with me instead. We would have plans set, and she would call and say, John wants me to hang out with him. He doesn't want me to hang out with you guys. Was he trying to keep you guys from Demi? Yeah, he took all her time. The text messages, would she let you read those or would she read those to you? Yes, but it's almost as if she didn't want to talk to us about whatever he was saying. She didn't want us to know when they were fighting as much as they would be. There seemed to be a whole other life that Demi was living through this time. Absolutely. John was in the phone. He's kind of always with her, always going on. Do you realize what you just said? John was in the phone. Was he trying to control her through this device, through the text messaging? Yes. As the relationship progressed, John's controlling behavior escalated even further. One time I was talking to her in between classes at our locker and one of our friends who was happened to be a guy asked us, what are you up to this weekend? And I saw John approaching from the side and he kind of grabbed her arm and walked away. She said he was kind of questioning her, who is that kid? You don't need to talk to him. I'm your guy. And I remember saying, gosh, like, Come on, Demi. She's a friend of ours. Just saying hi. I was definitely annoyed for her, but I honestly don't think I was ever afraid for her. I, I never in a million years would expect him to get physical with her or hurt her. Isolation, jealousy, control. Demi's friends witnessed John's bad behavior, but never saw it as a serious sign of trouble nor mentioned it to her parents. Nonetheless, 
Demi's mom, Jody, sensed her daughter's distress. Did Demi's demeanor change within this relationship? It definitely changed, yes. I heard her on the phone crying a lot with him, but I didn't look at it as something really wrong was going on. Like, that to me was, okay, she's not happy anymore. As far as an abusive red flag, no. Was there anything else that really spoke to you in, in kind of a, a real way that, that this relationship was a bit problematic? Toward the end, she would use phrases like, oh, he's just crazy. He wanted her to quit cheerleading. And I said, why would he want you to quit cheerleading? You love cheerleading. And she said, oh, well, he just said, if I don't cheerlead, then we can spend more time together. And that's when I said to her, look, Dem, I think you need to, like, end this relationship. And she agreed. That summer, Demi broke up with John and began to spend time with another boy from school. Days before her 16th birthday, she invited him to her home, unaware that John was at a friend's house just next door. I heard some commotion downstairs. As I was making my way down the steps, I saw Demi like halfway out the door. She said, John came and scared this boy and said he was going to take a screwdriver and he was going to break the windows out of this boy's truck. I pulled her back in the house and I locked the door and I said, you're staying in, that's, you know, that's it. And when I went upstairs, I heard her made a phone call. All I can remember her saying verbatim was, can you believe he did that? Instead of being fearful, it was almost like he must really like me. That was concerning to you. That was really concerning to me. Because this was me. an escalation. Yes. He had control over her. More than I did. If I had to boil this case down to a nutshell, um, I think the takeaway line is, if I can't have you, then nobody can. We've heard it a million times, but in this case, it played out to its tragic consequences. He walked into that townhouse, you're convinced, with a plan to kill them. With a plan, with the intent, and a knife to carry it out with. What evidence did you present? We had powerful text message evidence. Nothing shows a person's state of mind like a text message. August 14, 2007, the day before Demi died. She celebrates her 16th birthday with friends, but is bombarded with texts from John, who is staying at a friend's house nearby. What did you learn in the text messages? Well, the first thing that struck me was the sheer volume of these text messages. I mean, this guy was texting this girl incessantly. He begged, borrowed, pleaded until she had no choice but to say, okay, Come over to the house, but we're just going to talk. We're talking about over 12 hours of texting. Yes. One of the last text messages he sent before he went up there to kill her was, is your brother Jake going to be home? And that, to me, had first-degree murder, specific intent to kill written all over it. Take me back to your, your closing. The most powerful piece of evidence that I had to argue to the jury was that the day after her 16th birthday, he stabbed her 16 times. I asked the jury rhetorical question. I said, first stab, has he formed a specific intent to kill yet? Second, are we there yet? Third, fourth, do you think he's formed it yet? Wow. 
After five days of trial, it takes the jury just 45 minutes to deliberate. John is found guilty of first-degree murder and is sentenced to life in prison without parole. The only time that he showed any remorse whatsoever is when he was faced with a life sentence. That's the only time? Yep. He had a chance to address me and my family. Uh, he chose to say nothing. This was a guy who was your son's friend, one of his closer friends. Exactly. Where does that come from? Nearly 10 years have passed, and Jody and Gary have not heard one word from John or his family regarding the death of their daughter. John's family has hired a new lawyer to help reduce John's sentence. But does John have any hope at an appeal? In 2009, John Malarkey was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder of his ex-girlfriend, Demi Kusha. Nearly 10 years have passed, and while John has tried to appeal his case, he's been denied each time. John's family has refused my request for an interview, but his new defense attorney, George Bills, has agreed to speak with me. You're filing an appeal for ineffective counsel. Basically, yes. What's your argument? I was hired to determine whether he was correctly represented. We do not believe the jury had all the facts. After the trial, the defense found a forensic pathologist who believes that John killed Demi in a frenzied, maniacal state. An opinion the defense argues warrants a lesser charge. What do you need to support a charge of voluntary manslaughter? Well, you need some provocation. Do you believe there was provocation here? I believe that there was a dispute between these two at that time. He was texting her like crazy. Yes. She was seeing another boy. Yes, she was. She had moved on. He had not. But he didn't break the door. Wow. Right? She didn't tell him to bring a knife to stab her either. No, she did. No, she did. You can't blame Denny for this. I can't what? I didn't hear you. I'm you can't sorry. blame Demi for this. Oh, the medical examiner said 16 stab wounds. Doesn't that speak to intent to you? No. You understand that this is a matter of whether it's first degree or voluntary manslaughter. What is the definition of a heat of passion? Not first degree murder. For John's defense lawyers, this is their last and final attempt at reducing his sentence. But for the family of Demi Kusha, John's freedom is not an option. He was a disgruntled ex-boyfriend who couldn't deal with the breakup. That's the bottom line. That's what it was. He's got a price to pay for what he's done. Today, Jody, Gary, and their families are only left with Demi's memory. This is probably my most treasured picture. Um, this is the last picture of Demi and I taken together. This is a photograph that I stare at quite often. When a child dies, I think you think about the period of time before and after. The grief is like a cement coat. And some days it weighs as much as it did the day you had to put it on. It's never easy. And it always hurts. In the wake of this tragedy, Jody and Gary have realized what happened to their daughter is happening nationwide. 
In the United States, one in three teenagers have experienced some form of dating violence. And the potential for a fatal outcome escalates after a breakup. In 2016, at least 14 people were killed as a result of teenage breakup violence. What on earth did you know about breakup violence before this? Nothing. I didn't know the breakup rules for breaking up with someone that was abusive. You never do it alone. Don't break up alone. No. I wouldn't have left her alone here at the house because I would have known how dangerous the situation was. At Gateway High School, Demi's story has created unexpected dialogue among teachers and students. Each week, a small group gathers to discuss teen dating and how to support a friend in an unhealthy relationship. How many of you know of someone who's been in an unhealthy dating relationship? It's a lot more common than people think it is. Your hand was the first one to go up. Tell me what you went through. I was in a relationship with a boyfriend, and it was very controlling. He wouldn't let me go hang out with my friends most of the time. I couldn't have my phone when I was with him, and he would always keep it. Did you ask for help? I did try talking to teachers, and they helped me through it. How hard was that to do? Very hard. I like to keep things to myself, and I learned through that that you can't do that. You have to let it out. Does that sound familiar to anyone else? We need you to open up your lives a bit, to share with us. I mean, does that make sense? I'm a parent. We can't protect you. We don't know what we don't know. I mean, this is a powerful cautionary tale. Do they get it? I think they do. This horrifying situation allowed us to have this conversation. Today, in Demi's memory, Jody and Gary are both committed to building awareness of dating violence and prevention. I don't want to come across like I'm some expert on dating violence. I, I am a dad who misses his daughter, right? I, I'd give anything to have Demi back in my life, but I can't. Obviously, I can't undo the bad. Speaking at high schools across the state, Gary hopes everyone hears his message, especially young men. To me, it's a guy's issue, right? And if you get enough guys to collectively stand together for what's right and what's healthy, that's how you make a collective change. If I would have known then what I know now, she would be here. I want parents to know, look, these are the warning signs, and they're all the same, clear across the board. Demi's the one that paid the ultimate price and didn't have a chance. And so I feel like I'm her voice now. Demi's story's making a difference.